Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Gil Gilbert Hosts. Many of you have tuned into previous Dr. Gilbert Host episodes, and you know that our broadcasts focus on answering your questions about the topic at hand. And over the past year and a half, we've tackled a whole host of important topics, ranging from veterans and PD, complementary treatments about PD, sleep issues and PD, cognitive issues and PD, and many, many more. And as many of you that had your questions answered during our broadcasts, I know there are many more of you with unanswered questions. And so we decided that we would dedicate an episode to answering those questions. Perhaps you have a question that we did not get to on a previous episode, or perhaps you have a question on a topic that we haven't covered yet. So whatever the case may be, here is your chance to ask your question and hopefully get it answered. Uh, now, before we get started, I wanted to let you know about a very exciting upcoming event that will help you to learn even more about Parkinson's disease. And that's our APDA Virtual Parkinson's Conference educate, empower, engage. And this will take place on February 15th and 16th, 2023, from about 12 to 3.30 Eastern Standard Time. Now registration is free and it will include sessions on the less common symptoms of Parkinson's disease, anxiety and cognitive behavioral therapy, the science behind singing and PD, a discussion with people with PD, a discussion with care partners, and much, much more. So this event is perfect for people with PD, their care partners, friends, and family. So register today to reserve your spot. And now we, we will begin our question and answer broadcast. And to help me with this task, I've asked a colleague, Dr. Drew Falconer, to join me. Now, Dr. Falconer is a board-certified neurologist and a fellowship-trained movement disorder specialist. He's director of the INOVA Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center and associate professor of neuro neurology at the UVA School of Medicine, INOVA campus in Falls Church, Virginia. He specializes in advanced care of patients with Parkinson's and other movement disorders, and he speaks nationally on various topics on movement disorders, Parkinson's, and deep brain stimulation. So thank you so much, Dr. Falconer, for joining me for this fantastic episode. Hey, Rebecca. Happy to do it. Hoping we can answer some good questions today. I expect it. I hope. Sure we will. Now we are going to get straight to our questions. We're going to alternate. Now we have received hundreds and hundreds of questions already during registration. But if you're tuning in live and have a question, please ask your question now in the live chat. In order to participate in the live chat, you will have to log in to YouTube or Facebook. And it's very important to know that we may display your question along with the name and photo you're logged in with. Now we know that we will not be able to answer everyone's questions. Some of the questions are similar, so we'll try to group them so as many people as possible get their answers. And also, over the next number of weeks, I will be answering as many of the unanswered questions in blog posts on our website. So we will really try to make an effort to get to as many as possible in one form or another. And so let's get started um, right, right away. And the first question, um, has come from uh, our audience that's tuning in now. And this is a question that we got in registration as well. I'm, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Falconer our first question. I'm interested to know if there's another medication besides carbidopa levodopa. That seems to be the only medication anyone's ever on. And I have tremor predominantly. Tremor does not seem to be responsive to this medicine. What should I do? Well, it's a very good question. It's a great place to start because it brings up a very important point that I think is missed in our world of Parkinson's care every day. Uh, and that is that by data that we have, about 80 to 85 percent of patients have only taken carvedopa levodopa for Parkinson's disease. And by carvedopa levodopa, it's important we, did, we note that I mean carvedopa levodopa from 1972, which is original Cinemat. For those that didn't know it, there are, as of today, 23 medications FDA approved for the treatment of Parkinson's disease and four amazing pieces of technology. And in fact, 13 of those medicines didn't exist five years ago. Here's where we see the gap clinically every day. We see people all the time who come in and say, I took Cinemet. Someone told me this is the gold standard. It's all we have for Parkinson's. And it worked, but it was almost incomplete in what it did for my daily living. And we then talk about the fact that, as with all great tools that we have, it's important to know their benefit, but also their limitation. And there are 
a number of different limitations to classic Cinemet that people live with every single day. And so what I, my suggestion, whenever somebody has a symptom or complaint that persists even despite therapy, is number one, ask if there are other therapies you can try. We have much newer and better, longer lasting versions of Carvedopa Levodopa that might carry you better during the day. We have once daily medicines, eight of them, that work in different ways to try to impact the pathway for Parkinson's that might help refractory tremor. And if the tremor is really bad, also consider the idea that you might just be underdosed for your Parkinson's disease. As a community of doctors, I can tell you every day I see that people are very hesitant to push doses higher because of this idea of a risk of side effect or other downside, when in reality it leaves us all just grossly underdosing our patients. So I think if your symptoms are continuing, have the courage to ask about why, consider pushing your doses higher to see if they get better, and if the tremor persists, which we do have rarely, but it's something called refractory tremor, then also talk to your doctor about other options medically and even surgically to try to alleviate those symptoms. Nobody should have to live with tremor anymore. I mean, we can really treat Parkinson's and the symptoms of Parkinson's incredibly more effectively than we could even 10 years ago. But there's a gap there between what people have experienced and what we have to offer. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm going to uh, pose another question along the same lines in terms of uh, carbidopa, levodopa. There is this idea or this concept that happens to some people of what's called motor fluctuations, where the medication works uh, well, but for uh, decreasing amounts of time um, as Parkinson's disease advances. And what is a great, so the question is, does levodopa become less effective over time and what to do about it? And so I will uh, tackle that question. So the first thing to know, um, as Dr. Falconer mentioned, is that there are multiple medications to deal with Parkinson's and multiple types of carbidopa levodopa. And so there is the sort of standard medication, the regular carbidopa levodopa, also known by its brand name Cinemet. And there are other versions of carbidopa levodopa as well, including one which is extended release and another one where uh, there's a combination of immediate and extended release beads known as Ritari. And these medications can be used effectively to try to extend the life of a dose of carbidopa levodopa. So one avenue that you may wanna pursue with your doctor, if you find that the levodopa is not lasting as long, is to try to find a formulation or a combination of formulations that may give a longer acting benefit. In addition, there are other medications that are once daily, that can help for symptom relief over the course of the day. And there are medications that uh, interact with the enzymes that break down levodopa that can also help extend the life of a dose of medication. And so if you are having this problem of what we call motor fluctuations or off time, where the medication is not being consistent, there are many medication changes that can be tried to see if we, if your, the life of a dose can be extended. In addition, there are medications that are as needed, so you don't necessarily take the medication all the time, but you take it if a particular dose isn't working for as long as you want, you can jump in with a rescue dose or as needed dose. So there's certainly many, many options and definitely something to talk to your, your doctor about. So that's um, a really important, troublesome problem that a lot of people deal with. Um, our next question um, is going to be uh, about a deep brain stimulation. Um, so you mentioned, um, Dr. Falconer, the concept of a procedure for Parkinson's disease. So we had many people ask, what is deep brain stimulation? What point should you be considering such a procedure? And what are the, what is the kind of the classic person that might want to consider this type of intervention? That's a great question. I think to answer that is actually a piggyback onto your last comments. I mean, what, what people don't realize, and this is all about how we think about Parkinson's disease and how it changes over time. Um, most people don't realize that the fluctuations that we are all afraid of that happen every day in the lives of Parkinson's, 
that those fluctuations are actually a product of the medication you're taking. And I think it's a really important point that leads to that conversation about better medicines and better, better therapies like deep brain stimulation is that we all have to stop blaming our day and our limitations on Parkinson's or age. Because if you go to your friends, you go to your neighbors and you're like, eh, I can't go out to dinner with my friends at five o'clock because my Parkinson's is coming out. Everybody just tells you good luck, right? But if you, if you put the blame where it is and say, I can't go out to dinner because my symptoms are coming out because my medicine's letting me down, then everybody's going to look at you and say, well, why don't you just medicate or treat it better? And it takes changing that mental approach to how we think about Parkinson's because we're all ingrained to just blame it on Parkinson's. But in reality, classic carvedopa levodopa, the medicine that most, if not everybody is on, only has a half-life in your body or how long it takes to break in half of only two hours, two hours. So that means that that fundamental medicine that is fixing the chemical deficiency that is Parkinson's is really going into your system, hitting a peak after about 90 minutes, and then dropping like a stone after about three or four hours. Well, what do most people complain about? What is the main thing that drives everybody nuts with Parkinson's? It's not even so much the symptoms. It's the lack of consistent response to medicine that then would let you go out there and live life, right? If I were to take a pill and I'd feel better for three hours and then my symptoms would come back or my symptoms would come back unpredictably because the medicine lets me down, it would be hard to be comfortable planning or doing anything. So my point to this, and this leads to DBS, is that we have to really think about our day as simply a chemical deficiency of dopamine, where at any moment we need to give you back the thing you need. And if the symptoms are coming out and holding you back, then that's our fault and our problem of not supplementing your problem effectively, smoothly, and predictably. And so the message for DBS is, don't forget, we are really with Parkinson's disease just dealing with a chemical deficiency. That's it. The brain otherwise is relatively intact. We do MRIs of the brain, a structural picture of the brain, and it should be normal with Parkinson's disease. Because Parkinson simply represents the area of the brain making a hormone called dopamine that we all need is not making enough and you get symptoms. So on a very fundamental level, Parkinson's is a chemical deficiency that then turns into an electrical problem because your brain is an electrical organ that, that, that then turns into symptoms. And we spend all of our time and energy trying to get the chemical part stabilized and better in the brain, realizing that there are limitations to how easy it is to get dopamine into the brain, right? And so DBS doesn't target Parkinson's at the chemical problem, like the medicines do. It goes to the next step and targets Parkinson's at the electrical problem to fix the symptoms. And so we think about DBS as electrical dopamine. It is a device, a pacemaker-like device that goes to that pathway that Parkinson's lives in, that goes to the pathway that we're trying to stabilize with medication. And it allows us to exert therapy at the source of the problem to shut it off. And in reality, the best person for DBS, the person who we need to start talking about brain stimulation, is the person who is fluctuating and getting incomplete response to our medicines. Because if we can't fix it chemically, then we need to address it electrically with DBS to stabilize the system. Because the beauty is DBS works on the same path as medicine. It gives the same benefit as medicine. Whatever the Cinemet or Levodopa or whatever does at its best, be it gait, tone, trimmer, if it gets better with medicine, DBS should make it better, but all the time or most of the time. It's giving us consistency of response in a tool that we can use to address the problems. And one of the big benefits is if we're leaning on the device to control the symptoms at the source of the problem, then we just need to supplement with medicine. And on most cases, we can reduce people's medications by 60 or 80%. And we have data after data after data. We've been doing DBS since 1996 here in the United States. We have data on top of data that shows that somebody with brain stimulation 10, 20, 30 years down the line are in every way we can measure marginal, mar markedly and magically better than people who are just on medication. So DBS is pretty cool. It works.
Fantastic. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Sema, um, which is, what is the prognosis of Parkinson's after DBS? Um, so if you want to just quickly yeah, I mean, uh, attend. That's awesome. The prognosis of Parkinson's without DBS is fantastic. For those that don't know it, as of today with good modern therapies, your life expectancy with and without Parkinson's is exactly the same. Exactly the same. You will not die from Parkinson's. You might die with it, as we all do, because it's a part of your journey through life, but it, it should not limit the duration of your life. Now, if we look at things that do hurt people with Parkinson's, such as falls, such as uh, infection, all these other things going on, um, stability is key. Stability of therapy, stability of functioning, and DBS across the board makes all the things we do just all that better. Fantastic. Now we have had many, many questions about the vibratory glove. Uh, so uh, just to catch people up, uh, a, a, a small studies uh, uh, results were recently released. A Stanford University in California's uh, lab was working on a glove that provided uh, vibratory stimulation to the fingertips, um, and they uh, released their results, which show which were um, uh, not controlled. So everybody received the same uh, treatment, and um, there were some wonderful videos. It was all over the media, and multiple multiple people asked questions about uh, our opinion about about this glove. So I will take this one. Um, so first. And foremost, we as a Parkinson's community is very excited every time there is a hopeful uh, potential development. Um, the uh, idea behind it is that um, many uh, centuries, de decades ago, um, it was um, discovered really um, anecdotally that if a person was exposed to vibration that their Parkinson's symptoms seem to get better. And over the years, there have been multiple studies where people have exposed people with Parkinson's disease to vibrations to see if their symptoms were better. So this is not a completely new idea. This is a glove that, that uses those same principles. The past studies have been mixed. Some of them uh, showed some improvement, others did not. And this was an attempt to more formalize this, this vibration sensation to the fingertips. And it did seem that some people got, got remarkable improvement and the team is going to conduct a, another study which is larger and which is controlled, which means that some people will get the treatment and some people will not. So everyone will be exposed to these gloves and some people will get the sort of correct vibration, uh, expecting to give the positive results and some people won't. And those two groups will be compared because as uh, the community knows, uh, the placebo effect can be very, very great. Um, so somebody who thinks they're getting a therapy may in fact get better from that hope, um, which is a wonderful thing as well. And exploring what the placebo effect is, is a very, very powerful tool in medicine. But it is important to know whether the improvement is from the vibratory glove or not, or from this placebo effect. And so that trial is going to be very, very interesting. I know many people asked, how do I sign up for this trial? And uh, the way to do that, um, it, it's not open yet. So I know that the, the Stanford Center has received many, many inquiries. We are not directly related to, to that trial. So I uh, do not have details about when that trial will be open or how exactly to be in that first group that gets into the next trial. Um, but you can go to a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Um, you can enter the information about the vibra vibrotactile glove and you can, it'll pop up that the trial will pop up and you'll be able to see whether um, there is, um, uh, that, that that trial is open and it will tell you exactly how to, to contact the, the trial. Um, and so that will be happening, you know, it, it sounds like in the next few months or so. Um, and so we're eagerly awaiting uh, the next round of, of research. Obviously, Obviously, if this does turn out to be a, a positive thing for people, that will that will be wonderful. It's also possible that certain people will have a wonderful, amazing response to it, and certain people won't have any response. That's the nature of, of medicine sometimes. And so, finding the people that are going to respond um, are um, you know is, is a very important step as well. So we're very excited about it. More data to uh, to be revealed to you as um, as it's revealed. So uh, thank you very much for everybody who wanted to know a little bit more about that glove. The next topic that we're gonna be turning to is the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. We've got 
probably 100 questions about the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And what this means are symptoms that do not involve movement. So we, we discussed levodopa, we discussed DBS, and we discussed a lot of the movement problems that those treatments can relieve. Parkinson's disease can also affect many, many, many other uh, functionalities. And it is our job as movement disorder physicians to address all of those problems. And so one of them that we can discuss so many of them, but one that came up a lot is lightheadedness. So many people asked, is lightheadedness connected to my Parkinson's? And if so, how and what can I do about it? Dr. Falconer. It's a great question. Uh, remember, Parkinson's itself won't make you lightheaded, um, but your blood pressure can. Um, it, one of the most common side effects of treatment, and this goes back to how Parkinson's operates in your body, is that blood pressure can start to fluctuate. Um, remember, Parkinson's might be a chemical problem in the brain, but the product of that chemical problem affects every system of your body from the tip of your head to the tip of your shoe. And one of the things that Parkinson's does is it makes the thermostat of blood pressure, the regulator of blood pressure, act screwy sometimes. And by that, I mean, your blood pressure doesn't stay constant all the time. It fluctuates. It fluctuates based on how much water you drink, how you what meal you ate, how you slept the night before, or it just fluctuates for the sake of fluctuating. And the blood pressure can run high, 160s over something, and it can also drop low at times. And so that in and of itself is a product of Parkinson's, but it's also a product of age. As we age, our body's ability to regulate its blood pressure starts to wane. Our blood vessel's ability to constrict and to dilate to help control blood pressure goes away. And so blood pressure becomes a really challenging thing with time. Now, the thing to remember is that our treatments for Parkinson's, the medicines we use for the most part, can make that blood pressure fluctuation more pronounced. And so a risk of treating Parkinson's, a risk of Parkinson's itself, is something we call orthostatic hypotension. It's a big fancy word that means that when you stand up, your blood pressure drops. And so if you ever add a medicine, if you ever start a new start a new medicine or change your medicines, or for some reason you just start getting dizzy and lightheaded, the easiest thing to do is to go invest 20 bucks in a portable blood pressure cuff, one of those automated ones, and take your blood pressure sitting down and then also standing up and write down those numbers. If you find that the top number of your blood pressure is running around 100, and if it drops when you stand up, then you definitely need to reach out to your doctor because then the dizziness or that lightheadedness is coming from your blood pressure not being good enough to sustain blood flow to your brain. Now, one of the big things we see in our clinic is that people as they age tend to add on more and more blood pressure medicines to lower blood pressure. And people will come to clinic on four antihypertensives because their blood pressure at one point was really high. But then when they hit 70, their blood pressure started to dip and fluctuate and they got Parkinson's. We started treating it. And all of a sudden, with all these medicines on board, their blood pressure is 90 over 40 or 105 over 60. And they're dizzy all the time. It is as easy as having that as a moment of just reset with your cardiologist, your primary care doc to talk about whether you need all those medicines to lower pressure. Because for a lot of our patients, freeing up the blood pressure to run a little bit higher resolves things such as lightheadedness, dizziness, and falls. Now, if that doesn't cut it, you're on no blood pressure medicine and you're still dipping, still dizzy. We have a whole lot of tricks that we use in clinic, so please bring them up to your doctor. We have four very good medicines that work to boost and support blood pressure. We always talk about above the knee compression socks. Remember, below the knee doesn't do much. You got to get the compression above the knees, medium grade. And then for a lot of our folks, if their blood pressure is chronically low, we recommend the simple task of drinking a glass of original V8 juice in the morning. V8 juice is the single saltiest substance on the planet. Drinking a glass of it with breakfast tends to give you a big old salt bolus, which gets blood pressure up. But it's important with all these tactics to remember that on top of all things that otherwise, you have to drink a lot of water. We are all dehydrated chronically. And if you're dehydrated, blood pressure gets lower, you get dizzy and it makes things worse. And then it also makes you constipated. One of those other non-motor symptoms that we all think about is somewhat of a motor problem too. But you gotta drink a lot of water, folks. Can't tell you how many folks that we've simply said, here's a jug, drink this every day. And their constipation gets better, their energy goes up and they stop being dizzy. 
Fantastic, thank you. Actually, we have a lot of questions about constipation um, as well as other gastrointestinal issues. So we'll take one from Don Kelly, which is how many people with Parkinson's have gastroparesis? Um, I will oh. take that, uh, exactly. I will take that opportunity to talk about the gastrointestinal symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, so gastroparesis refers to a slowing of the gut, of the upper gut. Um, and so it is extraordinarily common in Parkinson's disease for the gut to be slow generally, the upper gut being the stomach um, and the small intestine, the lower gut being the, the large intestine. Both of these can be slow. Large intestine slowness causes constipation. Upper gastrointestinal slowness causes what's called gastroparesis. Um, gastroparesis, the symptoms that one might experience is a feeling of bloating, sometimes nausea, abdominal pain, um, and these symptoms can be very, very common. And in addition, they can affect how medications are absorbed. So a medication enters the stomach first and may hang out in the stomach for way too long because of gastroparesis, and there isn't a lot of movement out of the stomach. And so you have these medications hanging out there, not getting to the small intestine where the medication is absorbed. So another consequence of gastroparesis is that the medicine didn't work or that dose of medicine didn't work. Um, it is easier to treat gas, uh, constipation than it is to treat gastroparesis. Constipation, as Dr. Falconer mentioned, is pretty easily treated for many, many people with Parkinson's. We have a whole host of over-the-counter medicines that are available in your local pharmacy to get the gut moving. And that's after you've done all your lifestyle changes, which is increasing your fluids, making sure your diet is fiber rich, has a lot of green leafy vegetables, a lot of not processed foods, um, met, um, uh, foods that can uh, bulk it, bulk you up and just make sure that um, there isn't uh, you know, a lot of, of hanging out and that things just kind of keep moving. So having the right diet, drinking enough fluids, making sure your meals are at the same time every day, those kind of things can go a long way um, in, in Parkinson's disease, constipation and all kinds of constipation. There were a lot of questions about probiotics. Are probiotics a good idea for Parkinson's in general? There's all sorts of claims about what probiotics do, but most of the trials for probiotics and Parkinson's have focused on constipation. And there is some data that probiotics taken um, regularly may help with constipation of Parkinson's disease. Gastroparesis is a little harder to treat, but sometimes the solution to gastroparesis is treating the constipation. You get that stuff out, you clean out the bottom and the stuff from the top moves better as well. So getting that constipation under control is always the first step. Sometimes you do need to um, address the gastroparesis specifically. And this, um, again, can be a little bit harder to, to address. Small meals, not a lot of fat in the meals, exercising between meals. So taking a small meal uh, and then taking a walk can, can really be um, uh, you know, the key. It's, it's, it's a lot of lifestyle management to keep the, what's in the stomach uh, tight, under, a lot under control, and then to try to get it moving with exercise. And that's, um, and that's something that, uh, that we recommend for people that have those upper gastrointestinal problems. Um, all right. So uh, there's a lot, a lot more questions about non-motor symptoms. We may get back to that um, in, in, in a minute, but I wanted to get onto another topic because the time is ticking by. And another topic that people asked up and down about is testing for Parkinson's disease. So mm -hmm. is there a specific test for Parkinson's disease? People are curious about the skin biopsy test that is newly available and about the DAT scan. Um, so that's a huge topic. I'm going to throw it to you, Dr. Falconer, and uh, we'll talk about testing. Yeah, and it's a great one to talk about because I I give I talk to patient groups all the time. I educate all all over the place. If you if you want to talk about Parkinson's, I'll sit down and drink coffee and talk to Park talk with you about Parkinson's. And there's a whole list of like the greatest misnomers that exist out there that are floating around. Um, big one is that the medicine only works for five or six years, which is absolutely not true. But the second biggest one that we run across is, is this idea that there's no test for Parkinson's disease. It's nonsense. Um, Parkinson's in the classic sense is a very subjective diagnosis, right? Um, prior to the tests that we have available, the way to diagnose Parkinson's was to have somebody come to clinic and say, here's my problems. 
and me as the doctor say, I think you have Parkinson's. Why don't you go take this medicine and come back and tell me if you're better, right? Which is incredibly subjective. I mean, our medicines are dopamine. Dopamine is a feel good, happy hormone. If I were to take Cinemet and not vomit, I would probably feel great, right? So we've known for a long time that the subjectivity of our diagnosis leads to an incredibly high rate of misdiagnoses. At one point we tracked it at our movement center and the people who came to us were misdiagnosed about 20 to 30% of the time. That's huge. We're dealing with 2 million people in the US with Parkinson's. Imagine the misdiagnosis rate, right? And so it's been a prerogative of our discipline to find a way to add objectivity to a subjective diagnosis for a long time. And we now have two very good tests that give an objective piece of data to help with the diagnosis. The oldest of the bunch is DATSCAN. Now DATSCAN has been available throughout the US and is fully FDA approved for this diagnosis. And it has been since 2010. So for 13 years, we've been able to take a picture of the brain that will tell us in color if there's a dopamine deficiency present. And a DAT scan isn't a structural scan. It's not an MRI. It's not going to tell you if you had a stroke or something like that. A DAT scan is a type of PET scan that actually takes a picture of the dopamine system and it's functioning. So what happens is we put a dye in the blood that binds to the transporters of dopamine in the brain. And then we wait to let it bind and do a quick picture. And it will tell us in color if dopamine is flowing as it should be or if it's low. And the connection between that and a diagnosis of Parkinson's is extremely good. We tend to quote that the sensitivity and specificity of that scan is above 96%. So if it's really positive, you got a type of Parkinson's disease. And so if the brain scan isn't something that's available in your area, or it's something that you have an iodine allergy and can't get the dye, well, we now have a really nice test that is a skin biopsy to help give an objective marker to help with the diagnosis. If you didn't know it, a little bit of neuro quiz bowl, the area of the brain that is the focus of Parkinson's, the substantia nigra, it is going away, making less dopamine, thus the problems. Embryologically, is this, it comes from the same area as your skin, right? And so there, we have known for a very long time that there are markers of the protein that's misfolded in Parkinson's in your skin when you have Parkinson's disease. So what the skin biopsy does, and we do it here in clinic, it takes five minutes, it's a pretty quick thing, is we take a little punch biopsy of skin, just like the dermatologists do, from the neck, the thigh, and the ankle, so spread out, and the company that does it will actually stain that skin for the protein alpha-synuclein that's present in Parkinson's disease. And if that abnormal protein is found in all three sites, again, 96 to 98% chance that it confirms a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So it's really important to remember that these are tools, they're tests, they're not meant to be taken in isolation. We don't want to line people up and just start doing DAT scans and skin biopsies. But if ever the diagnosis is in question or the shoe doesn't seem to fit well, we have two very good FDA approved and covered by insurance options that give a degree of objectivity to an otherwise subjective diagnosis. Great information. And that leads us directly to our next topic, which is atypical Parkinson's. Mm. Um, so Horatio asked the question, what, and many other people asked about this in registration, what is atypical Parkinson's? What are the consequences and what does that mean? This is a huge topic. We could, of course, dedicate a whole hour to this. But um, atypical Parkinson's is basically our way of saying that um, you have Parkinson-like symptoms. You have some features in your uh, symptomatology that sort of look like Parkinson's, but there are other features that make us pretty sure that you don't have classic Parkinson's disease. There are many different other diseases that fall into this broad category of atypical Parkinson's. Another way to refer to this group is Parkinson plus syndromes, um, and sometimes those are used, and the classic Parkinson plus syndromes are a multiple system atrophy, um, cortical basal uh, gang uh, ganglionic degeneration, and uh, something called uh, PSP or, uh, 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 sorry, I'm progressive supranuclear palsy. 
sorry about that. Um, and a fourth, which we can talk about sort of on a separate note, because lots of people asked about this separately, is something called Lewy body dementia. I'm going to have Dr. Falcon talk about that one next. Um, so we have those four types of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, which are not actually cl uh, classically Parkinson's disease, but they're somewhat related. Now, these atypical Parkinson's syndromes um, have in common that they are not as responsive to the medications that we typically give for Parkinson's disease. And they typically have a more aggressive course, which means that we, you know, as Dr. Falconer said, you don't die of Parkinson's, you die uh, with Parkinson's. It's usually decades long, a uh, very slow progression. In these atypical Parkinson's syndromes, that is not always the case. You can have a more rapid progression. So it is a bit of a more um, serious diagnosis. Um, not always, and there's always going to be a variability. Some people do have a longer course or their course resembles Parkinson's really, really tightly for many, many years. And then something happens that makes people feel like, oh, maybe this isn't classic Parkinson's. That pattern um, can be seen as well. And so there is a, a lot of variability within this atypical Parkinson's category. Um, so you know, the question that Horatio asked, what is the time lag? Uh, presumably meaning what is, you know, what is the time course of this other, other series of illnesses? Very hard to give um, any exact numbers um, for any particular individual. Um, and, uh, and so what we focus on for these atypical Parkinson's uh, conditions is uh, there's less of a focus on, on helping the movement because the movements can can be helped by some of the Parkinson's medications, but it's less likely to be um, a, a, a real boost like it is for regular Parkinson's. Um, and we focus more on uh, just focusing on quality of life, addressing the issues that are um, impeding quality of life. And so that's that's more of the, of the goal when you're seeing your neurologist. So hopefully that, um, that answers Horatio's question and some of the others that came up. Um, separately, many, many people asked about uh, Lewy body dementia. What is Lewy body dementia? Is it the same thing as Parkinson's? It's different. I was told I had Lewy body dementia. What does that mean? And can you address uh, that really confusing topic? Dr. Falconer. I'll just bite right into that one. Uh, that's <laughs> a big one. So first off, I want to remind folks that Parkinson's disease is a Lewy body disease. If you have Parkinson's, you have Lewy bodies in your brain. The Lewy body is the histopathologic hallmark of Parkinson's. Fancy way of saying that when Dr. Lewy first was looking at the brains of Parkinson's, we'll say anywhere from 200 years ago to whenever Dr. Lewy was practicing, I don't remember right now, um, he saw these little abnormal collections of protein in the area of the brain where Parkinson's lives, the substantia nigra. So what's happening with Parkinson's? Parkinson's, not dementia yet is that this protein alpha synuclein is misfolding and the cells in the brain can't get rid of it. It's kind of clogging up the garbage disposal, right? And so the brain's response is to say, okay, I'm going to take all this protein that's piling up and put it in a big old hefty bag, trash bag, and just stick it off to the side, right? And those hefty bags, we can see when we stain the brain as a little collection of proteins. And it was discovered by Dr. Louis, so we call them Louis bodies. What happens with Parkinson's is that those hefty bags build up. The trash builds up because your brain ends up being a hoarder for these proteins. It kills the cell. It goes to the next cell and it propagates itself and thus the progression of Parkinson's, right? The nucleus in the brain that makes dopamine, the thing that is low that causes the symptoms we fight every day, is the substantia nigra. Right next door to that nucleus is a different nucleus that produces the main neurotransmitter for memory. It's a nucleus called the nucleus basalis of Maynard, actually named after a medical student, if anybody was curious, and it produces the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So what happens with Parkinson's is those little proteins in the Lewy body stay in the area that affects dopamine. But if they migrate the two or three millimeters over to that other nucleus, they start to impact the circuits that deal with memory. And so you end up with a condition where you have Parkinson's disease, as well as memory issues, cognitive change, and classically hallucinations. Now, if this shift to include memory happens early, so if it happens within the first few years of diagnosis, we call that Lewy body dementia. 
Don't forget, if you have Lewy body dementia, you have to you have Parkinson's too. And this is a hotly debated topic. I was at a round table where, where it was an argument between the movement docs and the psychiatrist because the psychiatrist thought you can only have Lewy body dementia. And I'm of the camp that I believe you have to have both. And I have never seen someone who has Lewy body dementia, but not Parkinsonian features too. So if it happens early, we call it Lewy body dementia. If the cognitive issues and hallucinations come on later in the course of Parkinson's, 5, 10, 15 years down the line, we call it Parkinson's dementia. The important thing to remember is there's really not much of a difference between Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's dementia. It's just a matter of time. And it all represents those Parkinsonian proteins affecting the memory part of the brain too. Now, the important thing to remember about Lewy body disease, Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's is that we have to treat both, but it becomes measurably more complicated to get people better because everything we do at that point ends up being a balancing act. We need to give you dopamine to get you moving better, but dopamine can make hallucinations worse. We need to treat the hallucinations and the cognitive issues because a hallucinating brain is not a healthy brain. But in some ways, aggressively treating hallucinations can make movement worse. So it's extremely important that if somebody's told you you have Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's dementia, to realize you have Parkinson's too, and to please, please, please have a movement disorder specialist be the captain of your ship. Because we do it every day balancing these two different competing extremes of the seesaw. But a lot of general neurologists who are doing their best to see three Parkinson's patients a week don't. So the imperative to it is to see somebody like us and let us help because there are things we can do. There are medicines that help. There are things we do to improve quality of life, even with Parkinson's dementia. Is that a fair answer? That is a fair answer. Thank you so much. Um, as we are rapidly approaching the end of our arrow, there are a couple of topics that we must get in before this hour is over. And one of them is exercise. So I'm gonna to go to our list of exercise questions that we got during registration and try to answer a bunch of them. So um, many people asked, how much should I exercise? What exercise is the most helpful um, to do? So try to address that, that next. Um, so first and foremost, uh, the, we must state the obvious, which is that if any, any body must move, that is anybody at all, um, no matter what their age and uh, what their diseases are. So um, we know that that is a good thing for the body. If a body sits, then it will become more stiff and will uh, not move as well, and that's intuitively obvious. So add on to that a brain disease, and the imperative to move becomes that much more important. And so movement in Parkinson's is absolutely essential. And about 20 years ago, people didn't recognize this quite as much, and this wasn't really talked about uh, that much. But in the past 10 years or so, there have been numerous clinical trials, there have been numerous um, investigations into how important exercise is. And so it isn't just that if you move, then you're, you're more limber, your posture is better, your speed is better, your pain might be better. Um, all these things can improve with more increased movement. But there have been investigations into how the brain is improved by doing exercise. And there's lots and lots of data that, that uh, indicate that uh, exercise can be very, very helpful to the brain. And there are many reasons why, postulated as why that may be. And so I think we can all accept that exercise is extremely important as part of the treatment of Parkinson's. And so, you know, you, you may go to your doctor and get medication. You may go to your doctor and get deep brain stimulation, but you also are going to go to your doctor to get Extra, an exercise prescription. There is no side effects typically. There's um, uh, really no downside to adding exercise uh, to your treatment regimen. So it really needs to be part and parcel of your treatment regimen. But what what should you do? What what does that mean? And it very much depends on where you are in the fitness. Uh, uh, cycle. If you're a couch potato your whole life and you're not fit right now, well, then you need to start taking steps to 
uh, increase your fitness. And those steps may be small um, and they may involve going to a physical therapist and working out what the best exercises for you would be to get yourself into to the next fitness level. And so everyone needs to be met where they are. And, and we recognize that. So you do not have to be a marathon runner on day one. Um, and uh, you, know, you just want to exp expand what your body is capable of doing. And so, um, so one of the, the, the themes is you want to do what you can do and, and push yourself where you are. So that's one important theme. Another is you want to get different types of exercise in. So aerobic exercise is clearly very important for the brain. You want to be doing high intensity exercise, exercise that makes you sweat, exercise that makes you get a lot of breath a little bit, not just little tiny little movements. So you, you wanna really work on that aerobic piece. But in addition, you want there to be stretching involved, you want there to be um, uh, 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 balance training as well. Um, so you want there to be different types of components of, of that exercise mixed in. Um, um, so so, though, so and I, I might have mentioned strength as well. So you want strength training, you want balance training, you want stretching, you want aerobic. You want those four uh, components to really be uh, feeding into your exercise plan. And another thing to keep in mind, and this uh, is, is something that's been um, understood in the past number of years, is sometimes novelty to your movement can be beneficial to the brain. So something that your body hasn't done before, it may be pickleball is becoming really um, uh, an exciting new venture for people with Parkinson's. Um, there's rock steady boxing, which you may have heard of, which is boxing techniques for people with Parkinson's. People have been, have, there's karate for Parkinson's, there's golf for Parkinson's. What do all these things have in common? Um, um, and they, they're all kind of new ways for your body to move. And that that novelty may be important. So so not to suggest that, you know, you, you must do one specific type of novel activity, but that um, introducing your body to moving in different ways may be a, a, a nice addition um, to, um, to, to, to exercise in Parkinson's. So you want to try to keep all those elements together. And then addition, in addition, you, you want to uh, ask your neurologist for a referral to a physical therapist. This is a professional who's had years of training and understanding how the body moves. And there are specific physical therapists who work with people with Parkinson's disease who can design a program for you. So that is really the first step. And you want to make sure that you're doing the exercises correctly and that you um, have a plan um, for, 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 the, for the long term. So that's, um, that's a very, very important element. Um, so I'm gonna ask Dr. Falker another question about um, physical therapy and exercise, which we got a ton of questions about, and that is freezing of gait. Um, so freezing of gait really quickly is a, a pattern of gait that we see in people with Parkinson's where they take multiple stutter steps in place and don't take that step forward um, and they get stuck. Um, this is really common. So how is this addressed? Um, what, what can be done about it? Sometimes medications are not enough. What, uh, what are your thoughts? That's a big one because for a lot of people with freezing of gait, being honest, it's, an, it's one of the non-treatable phenomenon of Parkinson's disease. Uh, walking is hard. Walking is challenging. There's a reason why it's pretty much us humans and kangaroos are the only mammals that walk around on two legs, right? Even monkeys, when they run, go on all fours because it takes every... See, think about it. Can you think of another mammal? Two legs. Birds? Sort of counts, but they're not really, right? Yeah. The reason why it's is because walking is hard. It takes every system of the body from the tip of your head to the tip of your shoe working together to get up and ambulate, right? There is a balancing system in our brain. When you say get up and walk, that not only keeps you from racing out the door, but also keeps you from being stuck. And Parkinson's disease breaks that balancing system that allows for the fluidity of movement. And there have been numerous studies over the last 15 years that in some people with Parkinson's, the freezing of gait component, the ambulation component is a whole different circuit outside of that dopamine one that we address with medicines. So whenever people have freezing of gait, what I tell them is number one, we have to make sure we're treating your Parkinson's effectively. We need to make sure our medicines are smooth, predictable, and consistent, and that the gait issues are not a representation of being off, which we can address. Number two, we have to make sure your blood pressure is good. Because there are some people that when they get up to walk, blood, their blood pressure dips, like we talked about earlier. And one of the manifestations is freezing of gait. And then number three is we have to make sure that there's not something else impacting the walking to cause it. 
There are many, many people out there with spinal stenosis, with neuropathy, with these other neurologic issues that lead to walking problems. We need to make sure we have a total picture of what's going on with your walking. And we need to make sure that you have a good physical therapist to address it. Because unifying all of these different possible causes of freezing of gait, the unifying factor is, is that it responds to physical therapy and exercise. And there are tricks we teach. There are tricks that our therapists treat, teach to try to overcome that freezing of gait, such as taking a big step to start, such as a laser pointer that puts a line on the ground. We have all these tricks and tools, but you have to be engaged with the Parkinson's community, with your specialist and with your rehab team to really try to integrate all these tricks we've developed into your life to keep you from freezing. Is that a fair answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, it's a tricky one for many people, but you know, ways to address it. So thank you very much. Um, we have another topic that we haven't discussed at all, and we're going to discuss it right now, which is diet. So many, many people asked, is there a specific Parkinson's diet that I should uh, use? Are there specific supplements I should use? Um, so I, I want to briefly address that. Um, this is a really, really important uh, topic. And what's and 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 so many people would answer, you know, well, we we haven't really done the studies. We don't really know what supplements are are you know any supplement that's actually been studied in clinical trial has not really given that um, result that makes us say, okay, you need to uh, use supplement X Y Z twenty, and that's going to help your brain. Um, what what has been shown in clinical trials, multiple clinical trials, that what is good for the brain is a Mediterranean diet. Um, the MIND diet is a variation of the Mediterranean diet, which incorporates a, a few other um, types of foods um, in it. Um, so what is the Mediterranean diet? Basically, it's a diet that is rich in fruits and vegetables, green leafy vegetables primarily. The source of fat is olive oil. The source of protein are low fat proteins, mostly fish, a little bit of um, chicken, um, but not, not a lot of beef and pork. Um, the There is a, a focus on a legumes, a focus on beans, uh, and, and those type of, of foods as well. So a lot of the foods that grow as opposed to foods that um, uh, do not grow. So though that type of diet has been shown to improve brain health. And there was a, a study um, a, f a couple of years ago in movement disorders, which showed that in a group of people with Parkinson's disease, if you adhered to the Mediterranean diet prior to diagnosis, based on uh, questionnaires, your disease diagnosis was delayed by years, by, by, by I think the, 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 the paper showed 17 years, huge delay in disease delay in the population that had had this healthy diet all along. And so there, there really is no comparison to, um, you know, to, to how to treat your brain if you treat it well with, with the right foods. And so what I say to patients when they ask me, um, you know, what supplement should I take? I say, it's about, it's about, all, and there isn't that you can't break down a diet in that way. You, you, you can't break down and say, you know, this Mediterranean diet really is these 25 supplements. And if you take these 25 supplements, it's kind of like having a balanced diet. You cannot replicate a balanced diet without actual food. And so using actual food as your medicine is really, really the way to go to improve your brain health. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. Dr. Gilbert, can I, because we run into that all the time. Can I add go real quick? It. Stop buying supplements, please. Coenzyme Q10 doesn't work. Glutathione doesn't work. Uh, nothing that tells you on your internet or through email that it will fix your Parkinson's or give you dopamine, they don't work. And they also cost a lot. I can't tell you how many folks will be on 15 things that cost them $1,000 a month, but then haven't tried any medicine since the original 1972 agent because they're worried about their $50 or $100 copay. Stop buying supplements. They really don't work. We, there was a study from eight years ago that showed that the closest natural correlate to dopamine is fava beans and bananas. And to eat the amount of dopamine necessary for one tablet of Cinemet would take, take eating over 2 million bananas every hour. So <laughs> just stop. You guys got to take the money you spend on supplements and treat your spouse to a really nice dinner because you will get more dopamine from that joy 
than you will from the supplements you're buying. I love it. That's very true. I, I say to my patients, the, the whole is worth more than the sum of its parts. Yeah. You just can't break down food like that. Um, so we can have one more question and then our hour is over. And so I wanted to end on this and I'm going to throw it to Dr. Falconer, which is let's discuss the concept of a movement disorder specialist. Mm -hmm. What is a movement disorder specialist? Should I be seeing one? How do I interact with a movement disorder specialist? First, a neurologist. Um, should I see both of them? What if they contradict in their, in their um, recommendations? Uh, let's talk about navigating the mm -hmm. Parkinson's healthcare system. Please see a movement doc. You all need to see somebody like me and Dr. Gilbert, please. Um, and to answer the question, if there's a conflict between neurology and movement docs, we're all friends because we, we tend to take care of the movement patients on a specialty level. But we always win because this is what we do. So don't forget we are neurologists. We were trained as neurologists and then got extra training to care for movement disorders. We see hundreds of patients with movement disorders every week. I see anywhere from 100 to 110 Parkinson's patients every single week. The way you get good at fixing this, the way you get really good at moving people forward to a better quality of life is by repetition and using these new tools every day. That's what movement docs do. Don't forget, in the world of, of general practice, cardiologists, GI docs, oncologists, renal docs, they're all internists, right? They did internal medicine and then specialized in cardiology. When you go to your, your internist and they say, oh, you have a heart problem, you are by sure you're going to go find a cardiologist, right? You're not going to let the internist run things because you want a specialist. Don't let that not translate to Parkinson's disease. We all are neurologists that chose to only do what you have all the time. Only about 20 to 24 percent of patients with Parkinson's will see a specialist. It should be the other way around. You need a movement doc to be part of your team. You need a movement center to be part of your team because this is a condition that you have that will be with you forever. But we can make it better. We can make your quality of life better. We can make the things you can do so much better than even 10 years ago. We can give people back the things that bring them joy, but it takes having a team that does this every day that can carry you during the dips and celebrate with you during the highs. And to do that well, you have to do this day in and day out. And that's what a movement disorder specialist does. Fantastic. So on that note, uh, we are d out of our time. It's 3.59 and we have to wrap up. And I want to thank you, Dr. Falconer, for joining me and answering as many questions as we can. But of course, uh, there were many, many that we did not answer. And I do want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge everybody in the um, watching us today for submitting questions. We hear you. We have your questions recorded. Don't worry. We also have all the questions that were recorded during registration. And as I mentioned, over the next few weeks, I hope to answer answer as many as I can um, on our APD website, and we'll send out when those are ready. So uh, be on the lookout over the next uh, number of weeks. So if you know someone who missed today's program, if you join late, if you want to watch again, this recording will be available later today on our YouTube channel. So don't forget to watch it again. And then of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new videos and live broadcasts. And for additional information and resources, please visit our website at apdaparkinson.org. And remember, before you go, APDA's virtual Parkinson's Conference, Educate, Empower, and Engage, will take place February 15th and 16th, 2023, from 12 to 3.30. Registration is free. We'll include sessions on lots of different topics, less common symptoms of Parkinson's, anxiety, the science behind movement in Parkinson's, care partner perspectives, et cetera. The event is perfect for people with PD, their care partners, friends, and family. Please register today, reserve your spot. We already have uh, uh, over a thousand registrants, so please join your friends to, uh, to hear everything that we're gonna offer. Please stick around for a few final messages. Before I go, again, thank you so so much for joining us, and we hope to see you soon on another APA program. Have a great afternoon. I'm Leslie Chambers, the President and CEO of the American Parkinson's Disease Association. 
Each month across the country, APDA is providing support groups, exercise classes, and educational programs like this one to support the Parkinson's disease community. You can find all of our upcoming virtual events on our website at apdaparkinson.org slash events. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, I hope you will consider making a donation to help keep programs like this possible. Your gift can help APDA support people living with PD through local programs, reliable resources, and groundbreaking research designed to find treatments and ultimately the cure for Parkinson's disease. Please donate today at apdaparkinson.org slash donate. And thank you so much for your support.